Amen. Good morning. I want to thank uh, Daisy and Nora for lighting the candles this morning. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, today, uh, the message, we're going to talk about John the Baptist. I'll give you a little background about John, my thoughts on John the Baptist. I was raised uh, Pentecostal, then Assembly of God, then I moved to Baptist. And I was still relatively young at that time. I was in my teenage years. And when I started going to Baptist church, I always thought John the Baptist formed the Baptist church. You know how we get in our mind, you hear John the Baptist. So I just figure he's the one that instituted and started the Baptist church. Was I right? Come on, this is your chance to say, no, preacher. No, I wasn't right. And then slowly through the years, you know, my philosophy changed on that. But John the Baptist is known for baptizing. But today we're going to look at him. The message is really about a mixture of that. But he was, <coughs> he came to baptize. I just want to give you a little history because it will make the sermon more sensible. Do you know, for example, I'm going to ask you this question. Did the Jewish people baptize? Was John the Baptist the first person to baptize? Now, my thought was, and some of you are saying yes and some of you are saying no, and once again, Betty was shaking her head no, and she's correct again. Dang it, Betty, we can't catch you at all. John the Baptist wasn't first to baptize, but yet he was in the way he was doing it. But the Jewish people believed in, that they didn't, they went all the way back when God gave instruction, Deuteronomy, that when the priest goes in to sanctify and sacrifice things for the people that they had to wash their feet they had to wash their face they had to wash their hands okay so that was a cleansing method and through the years the jewish people and it was called something else that i can't pronounce they didn't call it baptism they still don't call it baptism but what it is they went in and had pools specifically for baptism now once again, they didn't call it that. that. It was for a cleansing. And you could go in, you could immerse yourself, yourself, or you could go in and immerse people at this baptismal pool they made. They even had the ranges of places you could baptize. They said a standing stagnant, stagnant body of water was okay, but that's the least desirable. Then they went up to... A, a, an area that at least it would get replenished with rainwater. It may still have been stagnant, but it would get replenished with rainwater. That was this, and then they worked their way up to the best baptism possible is a lake, a body of water like a pond or something that gets replenished, that flows. That's the best. And they did it for cleansing purposes uh, not in the same manner we do. We baptize when you receive Jesus Christ as a symbolic symbol of acceptance of God in your life, of Jesus Christ's personal Savior. They did it frequently. In fact, in archaeological, as they dug up old Jerusalem, they found big homes. I mean, these homes would hold 50 or 60 people. And most of them had one or two of these places, they call what, whatever the Jewish name they call them, for areas for people to cleanse through baptism or through immersion. So I just wanted you to know that because I'm going to talk about John the Baptist. You may not be interested in that, but my question as I read that, because I'm going to read something today that's going to make you wonder, well, was John the Baptist the first to baptize? The answer is, no, but yes, in the way he was doing it, for why he was doing it. So just to clear that up so you'll see, because what he did was revolutionary. Even though they emerged, 
What he did was revolutionary, and he dared to do it. And uh, sometimes God dares us to do something that looks totally different and unique to what the world's doing, but we just continue on. We just continue on, continue on. May God truly bless you. May the, the sermon be powerful for you, for you. May the Holy Spirit uh, hear this, give you what you need today, whether it's comfort, whether it's joy, whether, whether just to relax in the Lord. But let him speak to you today uh, and welcome the Spirit. Let's join together in our call to worship. We have received life as a gift from you, Creator God. We have received the light that sh uh, shows us the path to peace and joy from our gracious God. Now we come into your presence at your invitation. Amen. Let us join together in our hymns. Uh, may our sound we make, knows how I said that, reach to heaven and he clarifies it when it gets there. Good morning. Please stand and join me in singing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs>
Hallelujah. And you know we'll do that without wings. We'll fly without wings. He'll give us that ability. Uh, exciting. Flash. We fly away. They'll think we're all UFOs when we leave this place. Let's go to the Lord and thank Him for His presence and His grace and His love. And then after my prayer, we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our grace, Heavenly Father, we thank you for, Heavenly Father, the glorious recognition you gave each one of us by receiving our sins on the cross. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You loved us each enough that you willingly took the pain and the suffering and the guilt upon yourself, Heavenly Father, for each one of us. We, we can't express enough how much we thank you for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to make a choice in our life, to decide to accept you or to reject you or to say, as some say, neutral, which is not accepting but rejecting. Heavenly Father, we lift up all those that have not accepted you as Lord and Savior. We ask, Heavenly Father, that the Spirit, Heavenly Father, would, would continue to press upon them, Heavenly Father, through words and actions that they need to decide to accept you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those that are being healed today because of prayers that went up to you. We thank you for families that are, are coming back together because of prayers that have ascended unto you, Heavenly Father, and you've helped that situation. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for protection that you give us each day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our very breath, our ability to get up, and we thank you that we could gather here the church, in this building. Heavenly Father, we just ask that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the words would be given and the words would be received in the same manner, Heavenly Father, that it would be ingrained not in our minds only, but in our hearts. And that, Lord, then we could walk the path that you have for us, an exciting path to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We give you all the honor and the praise, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, just once again, we thank you for loving us so very much. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name and pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father. Have the children, please. This is going to be the last week for the fan drive for the pre store. So we have two fans and some money. So get y'all the one that's needed for the fan drive for the pre store and pull through today. Is that Good morning. Good morning. So, what is this? It's a, it's a piece of yarn that you took. Yarn or string. And when you first look at this, it looks like one thing. But if you look at the ends, it's actually several. In this case, I think there's two, maybe three. And they're braided. Very good. They're braided. And one by itself isn't very strong, 
but if you braid two together, it becomes very strong. And when you buy some of these, they'll tell you how much weight they'll hold or how much, how much you can pull on them before they'll break. Even if they become frayed and you cut some down, you still have a lot of strength when you combine it and put it together. So it's braided. Now, I brought some, I call pipe cleaners, and this represents your guys' lives. And the green, the yellow is, is you guys, and guess what the green is representing? Nope, very good, represents the world. So as you grow and mature, the world and you gets wrapped all together, okay? And so your lives, which is indicated by your yellow and then the green, is the world. And so the more you get into the world, the tighter this becomes. And the tighter it becomes, the harder it is for you to see God in your life because the world is really tightening its grip on you. And you, it just keeps on. So I'm going to show you something different. Yes. What? Just say hallelujah. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> this is you again. Right here. Representing you, your spirit, your work, what you do. And then when you ask Jesus, and I'm using red because his blood was shed for us. When you ask Jesus to come into your life, then he's willingly wanting to do that. So when you do that, it looks like this. So when you ask Jesus to come into your life, the red, his love, intermingles with you not the world. Now here's the key to this. Some people are satisfied, Daisy, some people are satisfied with just this. But if you really want a strong connection, then you work on it. And if I was continue to twist this and twist this and twist this, it becomes stronger. How do I incorporate God's love in my life if he comes in automatically. One, I go to church because that's where I learn about them and I hear about them. Two, I read the Bible and Bible stories. And then I also pray. And I may be a child, I may not be very old, or I may be a young Christian and don't know how to pray, but you just talk to him like he's your friend because he is. And the more you do those, the tighter this becomes, and the stronger the bond becomes. And why you want a strong bond is because you don't want Christ easily removed from your life. He won't be. He'll stay with you, but the world will try to come in place, replace him. And then you get him so tight in your life that you have a very strong bond. Then, whenever there's danger... Or there's difficulties, that bond will be there and be so tight, you'll know it. And you'll say, I can get through this. I can get through this because he is with me. Let's pray. Our grace, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that when we ask you into our life, Heavenly Father, you're willing and more than happy and pleased to do that. We just ask, Lord, that when we do that, then we'll realize we have an effort to include you in all parts of our life, not just our church life, but all our life, and that that bond between you and I can be strong. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we have individuals for offering, please? <laughs>
Grace Heavenly Father, we have so many things to thank you for. Most important, Heavenly Father, is your presence in our lives as we accept you as Lord and Savior. Your guidance, your leadership, your conviction, your comfort, and our joy we receive from you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to return a portion of what you have presented us with to share that it might reach out and the gospel be taken to those that do not know you and their lives can be changed drastically. Not only for now, but for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. This will come from a scripture if I get to it. This may be a two-part. I'm going to watch the time for once. And uh, it may be a two-part sermon, depending on how the Holy Spirit leads me here. Uh, so we'll go with the flow. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, John, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Uh, Matthew and John tells the most about John the Baptist. I can't do all the scriptures involved with them. I'm going to do a number. And somebody said, why do you use so much scripture when you could just tell the story? I can. But why I use scripture is because I don't think I, including myself and you, we spend enough time in scripture. And why just believe me when you can see it on screen? That way, if you don't agree, we can have a discussion or you can go home and say, yep, that's what it said, even in my Bible. So um, that's why I spend a little more time with scripture on the screens. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of, Ju of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The key here is not, everybody dwells on, the kingdom of heaven has come near. And they think, what he's talking about, is that Jesus Christ has arrived on the scene. He's talking about the new covenant coming. He's talking about a message that has been given to him. He was in the wilderness. He comes. He hasn't been affected by society too much. He, he's been directed since he was a baby. Remember, Jesus and John has met once before, have they not? And that was when uh, they were both in the womb. And John, who is a cousin of Jesus, is six months older approximately so and remember uh, in Elizabeth uh, belly he he squirmed or he knew when the baby infant not born okay Jesus was near him even then so the power of God is upon John from, from before he was born so here he comes and the key here is the first word his Statement, his preaching is repent, repent, repent. A lot of people at that time, remember I just told you about the immersion, and that's what they call it. They were going to be cleansed. They was cleansed of their sin through this act of bathing immersion. Okay, but their real forgiveness, uh, that was maybe on a daily basis, their real forgiveness was through the sacrifice that the priests were doing. Okay, this was just something to kind of fulfill obligations, or, or especially priests on, on very important, you know, sometimes when they address the people, they had sacrifice for them, plus they would uh, have areas where they could emerge, so they could wash away the sin, is what they're saying. So here he's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now I want to sh show you what I don't believe, he's talking about just, Christ coming is because of the next verse. We have to jump up to uh, chapter 4, verse 17. From that, this is talking about Jesus starting his ministry. And it says, after John is arrested, Jesus fully then engages into his ministry. And this is what he says. Notice, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. After John was arrested, he said, repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The very same message. Do you think he took that from John hearing him preach? Or do you think they was given both the same message? We know the answer. They was given both the same message. And the message is repent. Repent. And what he's talking about, somebody says, well, they could still be talking about Jesus' ministry here on earth. Absolutely. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. But I want to give you this fact. It's been 2,000 some years. Right? 2,000 some years since the birth of Jesus Christ we're celebrating. And you say, well, how would he say that's near? Well, when you live where there is no time, when you have lived through eternities and eternities and eternities, and time is not an object, this 2,000 years would seem how much? Like a thimbleful. I always think of the time here on earth, the whole existence of humans from, from beginning to end of humanity is a, is a, a thimbleful in the whole realm of time. And he is saying Jesus Christ has arrived. There's not going to be a flood. You're all going to be forgiven. The kingdom on earth has come. A new covenant is established. And that kingdom will be set up when Jesus comes back on earth and govern for a thousand years. And we're approaching that. Every day is closer. Every day is closer. The whole thing is... What we need to still be proclaiming is the first word. If you have a message for anybody in the world, it would be the first word. Repent. But you see, that word instantly aggravates people. Think about it. You tell somebody, calm down, you just need to repent. Whoa! You think they're going to calm down after you say that? First, they're going to look at you and say, Reap with this neural on the thing. Repent of what? Why do you think there's so much anger? You know, you, I don't know, there was two or three mass shooting. Mass shooting is four or more people this week. I, I probably haven't even kept track. I, I don't know. I know there was four different places across the United States. Why are people so angry that the only way to get back at somebody is, well, I'm going to whatever. I'm just going to go right down there. I'm mad at that store, and I don't know who's there, and I don't know if the cashier that, that made me mad is there, but I'm just going to go down there, and I'm going to do this. <coughs> Why? Because ingrained in most people today is, I haven't done anything wrong. I have been wronged. See, that takes on a whole different... I have been wrong. Somebody wronged me. That's probably not correct English, is it? Anyway, I never profess to teach English. But people says, you know, they wronged me. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to straight down there. They don't know who I am. They don't know. You know what? All we're asking is, Everybody, in, according to Scripture, all people have sinned. We have thought processes that are sinful. We don't have to carry that act out. We have thought processes that are sinful. When we do something God doesn't want us to do, when, when we don't give that dollar that we should, or when we did and we shouldn't have, there's all kind of things in our life that are sinful, and we need to ask God, we repent of that. We're, we're, we're going to Him and saying, I'm sorry, and you're not repenting to me. You repent, you're sorry that whatever it was, sometimes, don't we teach kids, if, if you do something wrong, you need to go up and tell them you're sorry. We tell kids that. Well, I, I don't know that they say that today, but we used to say, hey, you need to tell them you're sorry. That was not nice. Yeah, but I know you were wronged. Because they go back to, well, they did this to me first. And that's justification for them to do what? Whatever they did. No, 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 it's not. <coughs> that's not the way you act. That's not the way you handle it. You go up and you tell them you're sorry. That's repenting. And then if they receive it, okay, and if they don't, okay. It's done. You go on. Christ receives our repentance. 
He accepts our forgiveness. You know, he gives us our forgiveness and we go on. So Jesus and John are saying the same thing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. I'm telling you what, we can change that statement today and we can say repent for the kingdom of heaven is even nearer. Is even nearer. Next verse. We go back to John. People went, so here John is. I just want to try to, this is highly unusual what is happening here. I told you about the Jewish people immersing their self in, in, but they weren't, they didn't go in on a casual basis or at church and get baptized. They were doing that immersion to, to wash off the sin. And, but this is totally different from what John is doing. So, yes, they had immersion, but to be actually baptized for forgiveness of sin, that's a whole different deal. Because forgiveness of sin can only be done how, according to Jewish? Something had to be sacrificed for you to be forgiven of that sin. People went out to him from Jerusalem, to John. Okay, he's dressed in camel hair and he's eating locusts with honey on it. You know, it's like you eating crackers with, with honey, but only he's enjoying these. I always wonder, you think he's still alive or not? I don't know. Anyway, it's just a curious idea. And John's out there, and I picture a bigger guy, maybe not, but he's got this camel hair coat on or whatever, and he's wearing, he's standing in the river. Nobody knows him. He came from the wilderness. He's saying, repent. The kingdom of heaven is, is, is here. It's at hand. And so people went out to him from Jerusalem, all Judea, and from the whole region of the Jordan. So people's coming from all over, confessing their sins. What in the world is going on here? Do you understand how unusual this is? Who did the Jewish people usually go to? The priest. They got all this handled at the synagogue. Here, this weirdo is out in the midstream of the Jordan preaching, and people are waiting out there, and they're confessing their sins to him. You're not telling me the Holy Spirit isn't involved in this whole thing? How can this even be going on? Instead of walking by and shunning this guy, they're coming from all areas to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. They confessed their sins and were baptized. Wow, and he, he's doing this daily. I mean, I don't know how many, hundreds of people flocking to him. They hear his message. They walk out. He baptized them. They leave. They, they totally out of normal processes among the Jewish people. Next verse. <coughs> then along came, you know that story, then along came. Here, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be what? Baptized by John. Jesus understood importance. Now, Jesus, these people before him and after him are being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. It'll tell you very clearly in Scripture, Jesus was, had not committed a sin. He was sinless. But he did this in recognition that he walked among us. It was something he must do so that we all will do. And he came to John, and John argued with him, said, oh, no, 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 no. You should be baptized. He knew him. I mean, he didn't know him. He hadn't met him. But he realized who he was, and Jesus said, no, it needs to be done. Next verse. So he baptizes Jesus. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Now, this is important. We read scriptures, and we don't put the scripture together in a sense. Remember, we worship here as a Christian church. God the Father, God the Son. And God the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, depending on your term. Read this very carefully. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Comes up. Notice what John sees. At that moment, heaven was open, and John saw 
the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son who I, who I love, and with him I am well pleased. Now what that verse is telling us is, that we just now have noticed and seen the Trinity on once. We read Scripture and we read about Jesus and what He does. We read about God the Father and what, what He knows going on. Then we, leave, we read about the Holy Spirit and its movement among the people and the believers and, and coming and resting on each one of us. But this is incredible. Because here we see all three. We hear and see. He doesn't see God. He can't see God. But God the Father, He hears His voice. The Spirit, He sees, comes down. And then the Son of God is standing right there. What a powerful moment for John. And I don't know if anybody else. John is able to see this. John is given a vision to see this. I don't know. Maybe people around can or cannot. God and Jesus both do not do miracles for pony shows. They do miracles at the apt time, and this was a great encouragement for John the Baptist. We'll, you know, because later, and not, that's not part of the sermon, but later he says he sends disciples after he's arrested to make sure that Jesus was the one. See, even Satan can tempt anybody. He knew he was. And they came back to affirm that he was. So, the Trinity appears at this moment. This is a defining moment in Jesus. This is his, if you will, the priest of history of the Jewish priest. They had a big official ceremony to welcome him, them into the priesthood. To say, this is a priest, this is, you know, and they do a fanfare and they'd be a big ceremony. This replaces the human ceremony. This is a, a ceremony presenting Jesus Christ from God the Father with the power of the Holy Spirit introducing Him to the world and what He's going to do with the world. And that's to provide security and safety for individuals. To came, he came because at hand is a kingdom and He came to save all people. Next verse. We go to John chapter 1, 19 and 21. <coughs> so people came to John, before I read this, the people of the elect, the Sadducees, Pharisees, some of the priests came, and they want to know, who gave you authority to baptize? First, once again, this is what he's doing is so different than the immersion that the Jewish, whatever word they use, and I can't pronounce it, use. What he's doing is unusual. He's telling people their sins are forgiven, and he's baptizing them. This is really odd, if you will. So they come out there. The priests have heard about it. The, the Sadducees and Pharisees, whoa, 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 what in the world is going on out there? What is, it must be the devil at work. So they go out there and they ask him some questions. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. Here comes the dignitaries. Walking down to the edge of Jordan. There out there is rough old John. Camel hair, preaching, repent. They hear him. Finally, they said, who he was. John did not fail to confess, but confess freely. I am not the Messiah. First thing he tells him. I like John because he talks in riddles. I mean, he doesn't answer who he is. He tells him who he's not. I'm, I'm not the Messiah. They ask him, then who are you? Or Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? No. Next verse. So a little later... They say, now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, then why, the, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? In other words, what authority do you? You haven't answered us. Who are you? 
Why do you think you have the authority to stand in the middle of Jordan and peep thousands of people, people every day are coming down, they're flocking to you to hear the message and to be baptized. You, who are you? Who gave you that authority? I baptize with water. Notice John still doesn't answer the question. I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. Does that answer the question? No. He's, he doesn't answer the question. Because they say, well, who are you if you're not one of these? He said, well, I baptize. He doesn't answer them, but he does in just a little bit. He just says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one of you you do not know. That's a real knife point, if you, if you know what I mean, because he's telling them, as Pharisees and religious leaders of the Jewish religion, they don't know Jesus Christ is here. Of all people, the people that study and the people that been part, they should know, well, now's a great, Jesus is not starting his ministry, just about to. Because when John's arrested, he really gets into his ministry. But he said, you do not know. This is not just a point blank. You do not know him. It's saying you have lost your spiritual touch. We have to be careful as Christians. We receive Jesus Christ. We want him woven in our life like I showed those kids. And, and to really get him tightly woven in our life, there's things we need to do. See, we can be loosely connected. We can accept him and say, oh, I got, I got eternal salvation through my acceptance of Jesus Christ. And you do. And then there's one little rap and we're done. First time problem comes, you know, we don't have that security. We don't have that faith that to help us get through that because we're not. <coughs> if we want to be a tightly wrapped spiritually, then we have some efforts we have to put out. I need to attend the church. I need uh, that that's that's helped me grow spiritually. I need to read scripture on my own. I, I may not think I'm learning anything from it, but I'm telling you what, read it. If nothing else, follow the daily bread or whatever those are that tells you how to read. You say, Well, I don't I don't learn much from that. I can tell you as a man of my age, I've read scripture my whole life. And I get excited now because now it's coming together. <laughs> what? Well, maybe you think I'm just a little dumber than anybody else. But the Spirit is really now kicking in and working because now I read this and it's fascinating. I, I want to dwell now into this and it, that's what it does for you. And it makes that tighter and tighter and tighter. And then that way when you get that tightly woven in like those pipe cleaners you can go through anything and still have your faith at the end which the world wants to steal from you which the world doesn't even want you to have i get tired of hearing people saying jesus is not real it's not to them i would look at them and say yeah maybe so do you but he is to me He's actively engaged in my life. And if I want them tightly wound, then there's things I need to do. Not just pray for my needs all the time, which, believe me, that's important. He wants you to do that. But pray for other people's need. Be a joy to other people. Be someone that they can look at like John, no matter how odd you seem, because to the world, you're now... Becoming a John, you are, you are odd if you believe in Jesus Christ. You are a weirdo if you speak about Jesus Christ. You're a John the Baptist. Or John the Presbyterian, or John the Methodist, or whatever you want to claim. I'm John the Christian. And that's what he's saying. I baptize with water. I, I'm a nobody, but this is what my function is. Next verse. The next day... Guess what? He saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look! Now, he's already baptized. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now he's really stepping out. He's on a cliff. Are you? There's Jewish leaders watching him now. 
There's people of, of influence, religiously, watching him. Are you kidding me? He takes away the sin of the world? How do you take away the sin of the world? You sacrifice a thousand animals every day for a thousand days. Maybe that'll do it. John just said something remarkable. You get to what? The, look, the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world... This is the one I mean when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Think of that. Jesus Christ came to him to be baptized, and John knew that this is someone that he's younger than John by six months. But yet he says what? He came before me. He was at the beginning of time itself. Wow. Wow. And he was, had the opportunity. This was his function. This is one who I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Once again, the Jewish leaders had no idea because they have not accepted Jesus. He hasn't started his ministry, but they have not accepted him as who he is. Next verse. I myself did not know him. This is John. The re but the reason I came baptizing with water is that he might be received to Israel. So now, why is he baptizing? So that people would receive Jesus Christ of Israel. To reveal Jesus to, to prepare Jesus for his ministry. That's why John is there. Next verse. <coughs> Last verse. Made it. Then John gave this testimony. The most powerful one yet. And he's telling people, this is what happened when he baptized. So he's re retelling them. Would you not tell that story? I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. He's telling people, I, I saw this. And I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. God told me who this was. God told me that was his son. And that was enough. The man on whom you see the Spirit come... Come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. In other words, John said, this person, he said, this guy will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Remember, after he was crucified and he saw his, saw his people, he said, wait, 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 wait. Wait 40 days. Stick around here because what was going to happen? The Holy Spirit was going to be turned loose on Pentecost. Who had that key to turn loose the Holy Spirit for everyone? Jesus Christ did. This is what he's saying. I have seen, I testify that this is God's chosen one. And my scripture said God's chosen son. God's son. No doubt in John's mind. And John met his death because he told, he dared to tell people something was wrong, especially high ups, when it was wrong. We have lost our fortitude as Christians sometimes. We don't stand up to what is right and wrong because society unloads on us. Because society, you know, I got to wondering why it's all about money today. I mean, it's more about money now than it ever was. And I thought, why is it so much about money? I mean, some people always was, but I mean, right now, it's all about, it doesn't matter how I get it, I just need to get it. I need to get lots of it. And I'm going, why is it so much about money now? Well, hundreds of things, but one, I notice, I go on Facebook, and I get these streams of things, and I go through them, and it's called Luxury World. Or this or that. Do you guys get those? I, I mean, I didn't, you know, they're just pictures. And it shows, oh my gosh, these places look like they're, they think, from heaven. And, and they're nice looking men and women there. And there's million dollar lot yachts over here. And it says, look at this. And they'll give you a tour through this $13 million yacht 
that you could own, or they'll take you to some place, and wouldn't you like to own this? It's only $47 million, and it sets by itself. And then they take you over here and show you this car. Oh, wouldn't you like this car? It's only $230,000. And then they do this, and they do that, and you're sitting there, and you're going, wow, if I want those, i got to get some money. And then our drive becomes personal gain. I'm for everybody making money. Hallelujah. But if that's your goal, if that's your end game, you're loosening your grip. You're just, it's not that. It, we're servants. God's going to bless us with what we need. If he bless you with great amounts, that's wonderful. But everybody today is after personal gain of some sort up the ladder money this that more of this more of that okay that that's fine as long as you're not putting all those things before the desire to know christ intimately better or to accept him in the very first place too many people now are saying god is not real you know how they prove it they say, just look around. All oh, those people, they're bad people, or they're people, they don't believe in God. Look what they got. They can't stand it. They want to be part of that. But they don't see what we have is internal. But they don't see that we have, when I go through a difficulty or problem, I got Jesus Christ to rely on. I got him to draw on. And what they don't understand is, I don't need a retirement system. I got eternal retirement. Jesus Christ gave his life for me. The least I could do is walk in his shadow here on earth as best I can and serve him and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we sing our last song, may we empower ourselves, even though we may be Look like a weirdo like John the Baptist to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and not be afraid of what the world thinks. Please stand and <clears throat> join me in singing Amazing Grace.
Our grace, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us all to repent. Those that do not know you to repent of their life and their sins, accept you. And those of us that have accepted you, you call us to repent so that, Heavenly Father, we might wash our feet. And Heavenly Father, then go forth and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want us to grow intimately to know you. To allow the Spirit to use us to share the gospel. May we depend on the Spirit, not ourselves. And may Heavenly Father, we work to intertwine you tightly in our lives. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you for sharing with us. And thank you for helping make us a soldier in the midst of a huge spiritual battle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.